Greetings once again in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. How blessed we are, how wonderful it is to be here on this wonderful Lord's Day, and a good day it is, because you can't ever say it's a bad day until you've seen all your days. Amen. So we, we are here and and it's a good day because, amen, if it wasn't snowing, it could be, amen, it could be a hurricane. And if it wasn't a hurricane, it could be a tsunami. And if it wasn't a tsunami, it could be a twister, amen. And then that wouldn't be so bad because you could not be here to see it. Amen. So how blessed we are and how wonderful it is to be here on the Lord's Day. We welcome SMZ, Philadelphia, and Vicentity across the country and around the world. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's see who we have. Uh, amen. I tell you what, I tell you what, I tell you what, since I, since I got on a little late and... Uh, Amen. Uh, I'm just this morning, if you would allow me to just let me say welcome to all of the persons who are in person today and welcome to Philadelphia and the tri-state area across the country and around the world. We are delighted to have you and uh, you know, on this wonderful Lord's Day, and it is, it is on the Lord's Day, it is the Lord's Supper. Today we will be observing the ordinance of the Lord's Supper immediately following the sermon. Amen? And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm just, I'm just so blessed and so delighted to see everybody today because, amen, Sometimes you stay in and, uh, amen, it's just good to get out. And uh, I thank God that he's allowed us, he has allowed us to be able, amen, to uh, meet once again. Amen. Let me, just, let me just call some states. We have folk all the way from North Carolina, Rochester, New York. North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. They are on the, uh, right now. Amen. Would you stand for a moment? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Bow with me for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you for another opportunity. We thank you for this morning early rising. We thank you for last night's slumber and sleep. And uh, it was not our winding sheet. We thank you for giving us the health and the strength to get up and make it out to the house of worship one more time. Lord God, we've come to worship, and we've come to worship you alone. We are not worshiping the weather. We are not worshiping each other. But we come to worship you and to lift up your name. For you have declared that if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. And Lord God, we need you. We need your drawing power. We need your drawing power in our church and in our community and in our nation. We need you to turn the nation for we claim the promise that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he turneth it whithersoever he will. And so Lord, we God, we ask that you would stretch forth your mighty powerful hand and touch as 
says only you can touch and we are trusting you we believe in you today in the masterful and in the marvelous name of Jesus your servants prayer amen amen and amen our choir is going to sing Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power, honor and power unto the Lord our God. Sing
How many know he's wonderful? Even on a winter snowy day, he's wonderful. He's wonderful in the snow, amen. God bless you, thank you, praise and worship for singing to the glory of his honor. Uh, our Sunday school lesson this morning will be taken from Ezra, Ezra chapter seven, and we will look at verses one through 10, and then we'll drop down to look at 23 to 26. And our key verse today is verse 10. 
Ezra chapter 7, 1 through 10, and then 23 to 26. And while you are getting yourselves there, just a couple housekeeping announcements. Uh, uh, again, for those who are in person, there is no eating or drinking in the sanctuary. If you need to, you can excuse yourself and go to the lobby and then follow the directions of our ushers. Amen. And we continue to remind everybody that if you are sending any mail, specifically tides to sanctuary, at Mount Zion, please send them to our post office box, which is P.O. Box 41839, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19101. Amen. And then for those of you who are in person, who are here with us in person, we ask that you use the tithing box in the back, or there'll be a trustee or usher with a basket you can put your tithes in. Amen. So to be healthy, we're not going to be marching as we typically would. Would do, but we have we ask that you would use uh, the the uh, the offering box that is in the back of the church. Amen. And also today, today is Communion Sunday. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Um, we ask that you would get your elements, your grape juice, and your bread. Amen. And at the end of service, we will celebrate together. Amen. All right, all right. Let's get into the Sunday school lesson. Um, before we before we get into the launch into the Sunday school lesson, I just want to uh, review uh, or just revisit last week's lesson when we talked about David and uh, David's actions uh, last week when we looked at him versus Bathsheba, Uriah, and how. You know, David was a man after God's own heart because David always found it in his heart to repent of whatever sin he had. And he would always not only repent, but he would not do that sin again. Many times we, we, we say we repent and we find ourselves repenting for the same sin not too long after. But David, David, uh, when, when the prophet tells him, David, you are that man and there is a year's timing when he waits uh, uh, with uh, when he takes to take Bathsheba, his wife. And I don't want you to think, you know, David, when we look at that passage, it, you know, David readily repents. But I think within that year, uh, David wrestles with himself. And, and the psalmist, when he writes, to, he writes two psalms that explain that experience. And I said last week that you should read Psalms 32 and, 30, and, uh, and 51. And when you look at Psalms 32, uh, verses 3, David says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of the summer. Verse five says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So David went through a period when he, you know, he tried to cover, obviously he tried to cover up his crime, but he also didn't confess him to the Lord. And when you hold out from the Lord, the Lord has a way of getting some things from you. And David says that his hand was heavy on him. Stick a pen in heavy, the hand of the Lord. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Stick a pen in that because that'll relate to our lesson later on. But w when you don't readily confess and, and you let these things, they weigh on you and they grow you older, all you have to do is confess. Once you confess, you are free from that. Now, you're not free from the consequences. Let me just say that. You, you, you're not free from the consequences of what you do, but your mind can be at ease. And it took David a minute to get to that point, when we look at Psalms 51, verse 3, it says, For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and only you I have sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So he realizes who he sinned against. Although Uriah uh, 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 was the one who faith, who he killed, Right. But he says, I've done this wicked thing in God's sight. 
So the question is, who are you more afraid of, man or God? David realized that he was that he should be more afraid of God. And he and when you sin, you do it because God sees everything and you can't hide it. But the longer you try to hide it or the longer you try to ignore it is the worse it'll get for you. So you best to just acknowledge it. It took David a year. And then that year when he tried to cover it up and he tried to act like ain't nothing and he thought he got away with it and everybody's calmed down. It was the hand of the Lord was still on him. Amen. So remember that. So that was just a wrap up from last week's lesson. This week, this week, we're in the book of Ezra. And in Ezra, there is no direct claim of authorship. The fact of the matter is when we get to today's lesson in chapter seven, takes seven chapters that we're until we're introduced to Ezra. Um, however, scholars and, tradi and traditions agree that Ezra is uh, the author of this book. Does anybody know what Ezra's name means? Anybody online, Dion, know what Ezra's name means? The Lord helps or Jehovah helps. Thank you, Sister Borden. His name means Jehovah helps. So Ezra was a priest and a scribe who wrote this book bearing his name. Amen. And although the Chronicles are unauthored or recognized to be unauthored, some people lean towards say that he wrote that book as well, as well as Nehemiah. Uh, so he wrote that tradition says that Ezra was the founder of the great synagogue where the complete Old Testament canon was formally recognized. The book of Ezra is written from a priestly perspective as a Levitical leader, and we'll see that later. It is an inspiring account of the Jews' great determination to rebuild the temple, to reestablish worship to the only living and true God, and to reestablish the nation. When writing, the author has two objectives in mind. One, to show the steadfast faithfulness of the returned exiles and to show the right path to purity of worship. God originally brought Israel out of the slave markets of Egypt in Exodus. Hundreds of years later, before the events of Ezra, God told his people that if they choose to break their covenant with him, he would again allow the nations to take them into slavery. In spite of God's repeated warnings from the mouths of his prophets, today we have the mouths of the pastors. Israel and Judah choose to reject God, God and to participate in worship of foreign idols or gods, in addition to committing many abominable practices which accompany their idolatry. True to his promise, God brought the Assyrians in Babylon to issue chastisement upon the wayward Israel and Judah. The Assyrians deported the northern ten tribes and scattered them all across their empire. And several centuries later, uh, God used the Babylonians to sack and nearly depopulate Jerusalem because, Jeruz because Judah persisted in her unfaithfulness to the covenant. God chastises his people with 70 years of captivity from which they returned to Jerusalem as reported by Ezra. So that's what we'll talk about, the second wave of people coming back. So this is reported by Ezra and Nehemiah. Cyrus the Persian overthrew Babylon, and the book of Ezra begins with the decree of Cyrus one year later for the Jews to return to Jerusalem, and it chronicles the reestablishment of Judah's national calendar of feasts, sacrifices, including the rebuilding of the second temple. As there had been Three waves of deportation from Israel into Babylon, so were there actually three returns to Jerusalem over a nine decade span. Zerubbabel, the first, first return, and was followed by Ezra, who led the second return, which we'll talk about today. And Nehemiah did likewise 13 years later in the third wave of returnees. Complete and uncontested political autonomy, however, never returned. So they never came back the same as once they left. Amen. However, uh, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah preached during Zerubbabel's time and following. The account of the return in Ezra drew upon a collection of Persian administrative documents to which he had access as a scribe. 
The presence of actual royal administrative documents carries a powerful message when accompanied by the resounding line, the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And you'll hear that phrase is repeated throughout Ezra. The decrees, proclamations, letters, and memorandas, etc., many of them written by the Persian administration attest to the sovereignty of the hand of God in Israel's restoration. The primary message of the book uh, uh, of the book is that God orchestrates the past grim situation captivity and would continue to work through a pagan king, a pagan king hmm, and his successes to give Judah hope for the future return. God's administration overrides any of the kings of this world. And thus the book of Ezra is a message of God's continuing covenant grace, grace to Israel. Now, as I said, there were three groups who returned to Jerusalem from exile. The first group led by Zerubbabel under King Cyrus. The second uh, led by Ezra. And the third led, led by Nehemiah, both under the uh, kingship of Artaxerxes. It's important to note, though, that although the groups originally returned were from the southern kingdom, as far as we can tell, uh, from history, no organized group from the northern kingdom ever returned to the promised land. So when we see these waves of deportees coming back, they're all coming back from the southern kingdom of Judah. We don't have record of anybody coming back from the northern kingdom. And I'm not sure why that is. Amen. So as I said, um, when you when you look at this, we're looking at waves of people. This is going to be the second wave. And it's about 60 years in between the first wave of, of Zerubbabel and then where we get to this wave led by, uh, led by Ezra. The first wave came in and they, they came in and they completed, they built the temple, they kind of got things together because when they got back to Jerusalem, it was a city in ruins, amen? But I, I, I want us to hearken back to something. Jeremiah 29. When we start at four, this is, we, we, I want to go back to kind of the beginning and Jeremiah gives us the beginning because Babylon was used as an instrument of chastisement. But he says in Jeremiah 24, he says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse five. He says, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives and beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may increase there and not diminish and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And I pray to the Lord for it, for its peace you will have for peace. And then when he dropped down to 10, it says, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. So 70 years of captivity and God says to them, get comfortable because you're going to be here for a minute. Get comfortable. And God says to us, I believe, years of a pandemic, get comfortable. Green, go online, stream your services, reach the people and reach new people because this thing is gonna last for a minute. And I'm not gonna say that this pandemic is an instrument of God's chastisement. I, I'm not going to say that. Very well could be. But God says, get comfortable. He tells the captives in Jeremiah in the beginning of the situation, get comfortable. Because you're going to be here for a minute. What am I saying? Don't panic if CNN tells you Positive tests are increasing at an alarming rate this month and the next month they say it's going down and hospital beds are, 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 are sparse and, you, and the hospitals are overrun, Debbie. 
and we panic. Get comfortable. Don't forsake the church. If the law says you can't assemble more than 25 people, go online. Get comfortable. Go and check that out. Get comfortable. And so here they are, after they have gotten comfortable, right? And they have built houses, they established themselves. They had families and lived there. Now God says, it's time to move now. Now how many of y'all listening to God? After you got comfortable, you got that job. You went to school, you got that degree. You got comfortable. Now God says, it's time to move. It's time to go somewhere. And so here it's time to move. And when we get to this seventh chapter, we're introduced to Ezra. And it says in the seventh chapter of Ezra, it says, after these things, In the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, after these things, after represents history, these a series and things events. So after a series of events, we get to this port. What was the series of events that happened? I'm glad you asked. The captives returned to Israel, and when they got back, what did they do? Their goal was to restore worship, so they restore worship. If they're going to restore worship, they're going to have to restore a place to worship, so they restored the temple. They met a little resistance, but they overcame that. They rebuilt the temple. The temple was restored, and now they have a place to worship, and now they are ready to celebrate their feasts, and the temple was restored in, in, in time to celebrate the Passover. And so that's when we get to Ezra, after these things, after a series of events, after they return, after they establish worship, after they establish the, uh, the temple, they're celebrating. And so we get to this point, and what we see when we get here is we see first, we see Ezra who comes on the scene, who lays out his resume. And we see his resume because he says, we see that Ezra, the son of such and such, and the son of this, and the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Etu. And we go all the way down to get to the son of Aaron, the chief priest. So Ezra traces his lineage, and he doesn't do a complete, if you want the complete lineage, you can, you can look at Chronicles, but he, he traces it back to say that he is from the line directly descended of Aaron, the first priest. So he is in line as a priest, and so we see his resume here that he is, the, he is directly descended of Aaron. And not only is he a priest, but he is also a scribe as well. So he's well versed in the law. He knows the law. He knows everything about the law. And look, he says, verse 6 says, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. God gives the law, but who's taking it? Y'all might have missed that. God gives the word, but who's taking it today? He was a ready scribe. Do we have any, re- any people ready? I know it's early in the morning. But he said he was a ready, he was available, he was faithful, he was a ready scribe. That means he was ready to study. That means he was ready to show up to Sunday worship, Bible study, church school. Because God had given it and put it out there. God gives it and put it out there. Are you taking it? Y'all can be quiet, that's all right. Y'all might not take it this morning, but maybe y'all take it later on, amen? But he's giving. God, it says, which the Lord God of Israel had given. Are you ready to take? Are you ready to take a nugget 
take something, don't worry about it. Hopefully y'all take it. And they granted him his request according to the hand of his Lord. The Lord of his, here it is, the hand of the Lord God was upon him. So we have Ezra having to deal with this king. And let me say that although the king is gracious, he's not a Christian, he's not a Jew, but he's working with him. I remember uh, about five, six years ago when we had the election and everybody was worried because when it was final, Sister Cheryl, it was like, um, Sister Clinton didn't win. We done elected a reality star, real estate cheap. Have mercy, yes, have mercy. What did we just do? But I remember Pastor Moore saying, he kind of reassured me, uh, hopefully he reassured you, but I always say that the answers to your issues, questions, or whatever is somewhere between Genesis to Revelation. And he reached into Proverbs 21, verse 1, and he says, don't worry. Because Jeremiah says, you get comfortable, you're going to be here for a while. It's going to be a little rough, too, because you've been carried away. And we're going to be here for a while, don't worry. <clears throat> and the reason is because Proverbs 21, 1 says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he turns it whichever he wishes. So for four years, we had to put up with whatever that was we put up with. Amen. But his hand, his heart was in his hand. And here we find Artaxerxes' heart is in the Lord's hands and he turneth it. And he turns it to favor these exiles. Now, he isn't totally altruistic when he does this. We'll look at that later, you know, but, but God uses him and he favors him. And so he gives them the decree and he went up, he said, the Lord, the hand of the Lord was upon him. When the hand of the Lord is upon you, obviously it can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. David says, I felt the hand and boy, my, I, I wax. He said, I, it hurt. But here, the hand of the God upon him is good because he's helping. So what do you want? How do you want the hand of God to be on you? David had to. You know, it took him about a year till he figured this thing out to say, let me confess and let me, let me truly repent. Truly. And so he allowed them to come. He allowed them to come back. And it, it was about a four month journey from April to August for them to leave Babylon and to get back to Jerusalem. But even and, and that travel wasn't an easy travel. For one, they had to traverse areas and they didn't have nice cars and Uber and trains and planes. They had to make this caravan walking, going along. And along the way, there were some people who may not be friendly, but because the hand of the Lord was upon them. And the other reason that they're successful is that Ezra made preparations. Verse 10 says, Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Three things he does. He seeks the law of the Lord. He does it and he teaches. He does it, he seeks. God, I just told you earlier, God is giving. Are you seeking what God is giving? He sought it. And not only did, not only did he show up to church, he paid attention because he got rest the night before. 
He was, well, let me just keep going. He wasn't, yeah. He sought and to do it. I'm afraid that some of us are good with the showing up part, but it shouldn't just stop there. Because we show up, but did you listen? Did you hear something? Did you grab something? And once you got it, what you going to do with it? Let me see if I can make it plain or make it second Mount Zion contemporary. Let me see, is that he sought it, he showed up, he studied, he, did, he, he sought to do it, and then he sought to make disciple, to teach statutes and judgments. He sought to make a disciple. Pastor Moore says, your job is not done until you disciple somebody else. Ezra says, yeah, he said that. I heard him say it. Ezra says, I'm going to, I'm going to make preparations in my heart. That means he was sincere, y'all. And not only was he going to show up because, you know, some of y'all show up because of what y'all done did. And you think you, you know, you're going to get a, you're going to get an eraser Sunday for what you did Monday through Friday or Saturday. I'm just saying. But he showed up with sincerity to seek, to do, and to teach. It just didn't start with just showing up. It didn't stop there. So he does those things. We see the sincerity. We see his heritage. We see Ezra's commitment. This shows his commitment to what he's doing. He committed to discipleship. He committed to leading God's way. And so he shows up, he's committed to lead, and he only can lead because he commits his heart to doing that. And then we see, after he leads, he gets support from an ally. And every now and then you need support from some folk, from al you need some allies right? We need allies. And so he gets support and he said, whosoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for this house. And he certifies and he makes this command. He sends him with a letter. So when he's passing through these lands, he can show it and say, I got safe passage from my ally. Do you have any allies? But I said that the king had some ulterior motives. He wasn't all to that altruistic, altruistic because he knew what was good for them was going to be good for him. See, they, he was a different type of king. He wasn't like uh, uh, the Assyrians who wanted to destroy everything and destroy worship. He said, if, they, if I let them have their worship, they're going to be peaceful. They're going to do what they're going to do, and they're not going to disturb us. And so he said it, it was going to be in his best interest to allow them to worship. And then when he sends them back, I tell you, the king's heart is in God's hands, and he's turning it. And he favors them that they should not only go back, but that they should have some rights and some privileges. He says that, you have no authority to impose tax tributes or duty on any of the priests, Levites, and all those folks who are coming with him. He says, use your wisdom. Appoint some folk now that you're coming back. And then set up consequences for those who don't, who disobey. His personal letter of support, his ally. So we see him leading. First, it starts out that they had to stay a while, build houses, marry, stay in the land. You're going to be there. Now it's time to go. Get up, move, this, but dedicate yourself. Commit to the movement. But then, and I'm going to end here, Paul helps me out. 
when I get to Galatians, when he writes that letter in, 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 in chapter 5, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be tangled again with the yoke of bondage. You have been made free. Don't go back to doing what you did and get tangled up. Unfortunately, Paul's message was way later, and they didn't hear this, but we have the fortune to hear this. Don't get tripped up by your past. Don't get tangled up by your past because what you have, God, Jesus makes us free. It says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty that you have. But, but our past, our past, our, pa our past is, is not meant to anchor us there. It's meant to be a rudder to guide us through the future. And when we look back at what we did, we say, all right, we're not going to do that. But sometimes we slip back. We don't stand fast on what we have now. We slip up. And these folks, these Israel, these Jews, they slipped up and got tangled again in the yoke of bondage. What I say to you today is that you're free from that. You're free from that. Don't go back. Don't get tangled up, as Paul says, in the yoke of bondage. Thank you so much. That's our lesson for today. Uh, next week, we will look at Job chapter 8. Job chapter 8. Now we'll have a selection from our, we will have a word from our pastor. Amen. 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 Everything is subject to change uh, depending upon the, uh, my boss. Amen. 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 Nothing etched in stone, nothing guaranteed, only God guarantees. Amen. But uh, thank you, Deacon Simpson, for our church school lesson, doing a wonderful, wonderful job. Amen. And, uh, and uh, I, I just wanted to say, uh, and uh, they just quietly do what they do. Uh, Sister Dawn Beasley and Sister uh, Angie Davis, Amen. They, they got our young people now, and they have the class with our young people in Sunday school. And, uh, you know, you see Deacon Simpson all the time, but I want to make sure that, that uh, I thank them for a wonderful job that they do with our, with our, young, with our young people. Amen. And uh, also, I want you to know... Uh, uh, we have with us today uh, Sister Tamara Wilson. Amen. Sister Tamara Wilson, she graduated from Westchester on, in December, and she is here today, and amen. We are delighted to have her, and, and congratulations once again. Stand up, Tamara, so everybody know who you are. Amen. Thank you so, thank you so very much. And now there is, there is, there is much concern and, and uh, so much that claims our attention in the world today. Uh, uh, Brother Trump, Brother Strum called me on yesterday and, and he's really going through, he, he and his uh, wife and uh, they got challenges and, and then the friend of his, Sister Sonia, uh, needs prayer, and uh, we just need prayer all over the land and country. And so at this time, before the choir comes to sing our hymn of preparation, we're going to ask Minister Tiffany Curtis if she would come and lead us to the throne of grace. Amen. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God who heals. Jehovah Makedesh Kim, the Lord who sanctifies and sets his people apart. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord God of peace. 
We come before you right now, God, interceding on behalf of your people. God, your word tells us to cast all of our cares and anxieties upon you because you care about them. To cast our concerns and lay them at the feet of the throne and your immeasurable, your measureless grace will sustain us. God, we come to you heavy. We come to you, God, sad and depressed, God, and not knowing which way to turn. But we're so thankful that your word is a lamp upon our feet and a light unto our path, God. Lord God, we ask that you would do what only you can do in the name of Jesus. God, we lift up Sister Wilson, who just recently graduated. God, we ask for direction and clarity for the next steps. God, I lift up to you your son, Brother Strum, God, his wife and their friend, Sonia, God, in the name of Jesus. God, that you will meet the need specifically and intentionally, God, in the name of Jesus. God, that your will will be done, that your divine protection will cover and keep, God. God, that your financial uh, uh, oversight will be done in the name of Jesus. God, I lift up each and every person underneath the sound of my voice. For your word says that if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, pray, repent, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. God, we trust your word. For your word will never come back void, God. Your word has not failed, God. Your word is your word. We thank you, God, for your living word, Jesus Christ, uh, in our lives. We thank you, God, for your logos word, your written word, the, the word of God. We thank you, God, even for your rhema word, God, which you allow pastor to preach Sunday after Sunday. God, we ask that you would touch our hearts. God, that we would uh, be changed by your word, God. God, that though we live in a world that is not of you, God, that we will remember that you reside on the inside of us, God. God, and though we see trouble all around us, though we struggle, God, though the world is against us, God, that we will have your peace on the inside of us, God. God, it's real. The struggle is real. It's hard, but we trust you, God. Remind us to put our trust in you and not to lean to our own understanding. What we see, we don't understand, God, but we have to trust that you know it all. And God, that you would do what only you can do. And that doesn't necessarily mean, God, that the trouble will stop. It doesn't mean that the pain will automatically go away, God, but you and you alone will help us through it. God, we ask that you will lift up this city, Philadelphia, God, this state, Pennsylvania, God, uh, Delaware, those of us who are from all over, God, in the name of Jesus, all Facebook, fam and friends, that you would be with them where they are. God, the corrupt politicians, God. God, even our children in their schools, God, in the name of Jesus, who have to experience so much more than some of us had to, God. Lord, our, our parents and our grandparents, God, who are entering into new seasons in their lives, God, that they, that the faith that you had in our grandmothers, in our mothers, God, our fathers, God, that you would rekindle that in the youth, God, in the name of Jesus, that we would see you, God, that we would know that sometimes we are the only light that the world will see, and that, God, sometimes it's not easy being the only but that you will never leave us or forsake us, and you are there, God. Every concern in the name of Jesus, every heartache, God, every trouble, God, we trust you and we love you on today, God. We ask all of these things. We ask, God, that you will cover our pastor as he continues to lead us in this season, that you have prepared him for such a time as this. We thank you for the leadership at Second Mount Zion, God, that you would keep every home safe, covered, and protected, God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you and ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
again uh, that God is still good. He is mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. And so we greet you once again in that name that is above every name and that is the name of Jesus God we thank you now for another opportunity we thank you for this privilege to be able to stand and proclaim your divine word give us power for this moment that we now Stand, strengthen us for this task. Prepare our hearts to receive what the word will say unto us. And in your own words, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. and amen. We're also delighted to see uh, Sister Diane Curtis. Amen. amen. In the house, in person today. Amen. She's been out for a while. She got, she got some new wheels. I mean, some new knees. And, uh, and she's out there, she's out there shouting today. God is, he's still good. Amen. And I think that's, is that Sister, uh, uh, am I looking at Sister Yolanda Fillmore? Is that who that is? Hey, man. You know, folk wear these masks today, you don't know who they are. Hey. Man, delighted, delighted to see you today. Delighted to see you today. All right, there is a word. Let's go to work. There is a word that's found in the third chapter of uh, 
the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Listen to the words of the text. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, now you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know whether what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garment, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and will also blot, will not, I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And, and just for a few moments, I want to talk about the living dead. And I didn't make that up, y'all. It's right here in the text. Yeah, it's right there in the text. G Jesus says, I know your work. You have a name that you are alive, but you're really dead. And whatever Jesus say about you, that's, that's what it is. Because he has eyes like flames of fire. He can see into uh, the heart of the church. Not only he can see into the heart of the church, he can see into your heart. You know, how, you know how folks say when they want to get by, they want to get by with stuff, they say, well, the Lord knows my heart. Well, he sure does. He not only know your heart, he knows the intent of your heart. He knows when you done the right thing for the wrong reason. Yeah, he knows when, you, when you've done it just for show. He knows if you've done it from uh, the heart. Now, that's a paradoxical statement. It, it is an apparent contradiction. You have a name that you are alive, but in actuality, you are dead. Now, let me help you out. Let me help you out. Let me let, let me help. Let me let Scripture interpret Scripture. Ephesians chapter uh, 2 and verse 1 says that you were made alive by him. You were made, you, and, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. And, uh, and, and if you go ahead and read the next verses, it talks about those who walk according to the world and who are influenced by the power of air, the air and who are influenced by Satan. You, he says you were dead. And if you are alive, it is because Jesus Christ has made you alive. The city, the city of, of Sardis, Sardis uh, shows such contrast between the melancholy feeling between the past splendor and the present decay. 
In other words, let me just put it, this, put it this way. They had a reputation that they were alive. But in reality, they were, they, they were dead. They were spiritually dead. That's what their reputation said. That's what the exemption, that was in the past. That, 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 that was in the past and not the present. And, and uh, my question is, uh, for those who can only shout about a 40-year-old testimony, when you first got saved, my question today would be, have the Lord done anything for you recently? Or, or you're living on the past and that's your past reputation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you, you, you know, you know, you, you know, those of us, those of us, uh, uh, Brother Presley, uh, from, the, from the South, we, sometimes we give the impression that if you had to struggle and go through, somehow the Lord is a little bit better. Because I found the Lord way down south, in the cotton patch or in the cornfield. But I stopped by to tell somebody today, if he found you in the cotton patch or in your office downtown Philadelphia, he's still God. He's still God. He's still sovereign. Salvation and deliverance is the same. I don't care where it is. And so you cannot, you cannot live on your past reputation no more than you can live on what you, today, on what you ate yesterday or last week. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you ain't talking about I had, I had, I had, I had shrimp and gravy. You ain't talking about what you had last week. You talking about what I'm going to have today. And I think what Jesus is saying, he's saying what this mental coach says to the basketball players, play present. In other words, be where your feet are. Because how, how often it is, my brothers and my sisters, that our feet are one place and our head is another place. The, oh, the, yeah, let's see how I can put it, how I can put it. The present moment is the only moment you can be alive. If you are not here in the present moment, you are missing your life. Did you hear me? I said, if you are not present right now, if your head is not where your feet are, you are missing your life. And the reason I know that, Brother Aaron, because yesterday is like a cancer check, and tomorrow is like money that you didn't get yet. The best time you have is right now. And this church was boasting about their Laura's of yesterday. Yeah, you, you, you know how I can always tell if a person is, is dying spiritually? They can only talk about what happened yesterday. Child, we, we, it sure ain't like it used to be. We used to do this and we used to do that. Well, what are you doing now? And so Jesus' prognosis of this church, when he, when he evaluated and examined this church, he said, y'all going around talking about you are alive, but you are really dead. And, 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 and watch this. He says, these things, how, how he addresses himself and introduces himself to this church as the one uh, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Ah, he has the seven spirits 
and I'm going to say a word about that in a few moments. Jesus is, is the complete spirit of God. I said he's complete. Because when you get to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 2, let's see how complete he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. The spirit of the Lord, Isaiah said the spirit of the Lord rests upon him, the spirit of wisdom. Jesus is all wise. He's the spirit of understanding. He understands everything. He's the spirit of counsel. He has the best counsel. He will never give you the wrong advice. He is the spirit of might. He has all power in his hand. And if you doubt that, on that Sunday morning when he got up, he said, I got all power in my hand. He has the spirit of might, and then he has the spirit of knowledge. He knows everything. He is omniscient. He, he knows how long you stood up before you fell down. See, other folk might judge you because you were down, but he knows how long you was down before you got up. He knows everything. And so I, I, all I'm trying to say is all I need, I found it in the Lord. He, 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 is, he has the spirit of the fear of the Lord. If you don't have the spirit of the fear of the Lord, you certainly don't fear me. That's how come these days folk don't fear their life or nobody else's life because they don't have the fear of the Lord. And so his prognosis of this church reveals their true condition. And I've said from the outset that, that every one of these church has an aspect of your own church and your own individual self. Now, question is, how's your church doing? When you view it through the eyes of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says, when you walk the way of the world, that's what caused you to die in the first place. When you walk the way of the world. And so their true condition, Sardis had, had significant fame as the royal city. They boast about being the royal city, but now it was nothing. And the citizens we're living off past fame. You, 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 do you know anybody that live off their past fame? They always talk about how bad they were in the past and what they did in the past and what I used to, oh, when I was, when I was so-and-so, when I was 25, I was doing this and I was, I was doing that. I ever tell you about I ever tell you about the buddy of my dad that he was <laughs> Oh I forgot I can't tell this. <laughs> you know, his a friend of his, he was about eighty years old and he was and he was declaring, Tiffany, and swearing that I'm just as good as I was when I was twenty five. And and the and the guys were arguing with him. And uh, Daddy finally said, "Won't y'all stop arguing with him?" Said maybe he wasn't no good at 25. He was always talking about he was always talking about his past, and and I'm just as good as I was. Ain't gonna happen. The citizens were living off the fame of the past fame. That same spirit, watch this, affected the church and their loyalty and their service to Christ was in the past. All of their excitement and their loyalty and their service hinged on the past. And that's why Jesus says to this church, your reputation 
is that you are alive, but you're really dead. But not only, not only do we see Jesus' prognosis of this church, but we see the prescription. He gives them a prescription, and it's right there in verse 2 and 3. Watch this. Be watchful. In other words, wake up and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before the Lord. The prescription is be watchful, be alert, wake up. You know how when folk come church, they are awake on the singing and sleep on the preaching. And yet they quote, the, they quote the scripture that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. They get excited about the singing and then they fall asleep on the preacher. Which the, which the singing only gets you ready for the preacher. But we sleep on the preaching. And faith comes by hearing, watch, watch this, as he, as he completes this scripture, this, this prescription, he said, be watchful and strengthen the things that are ready to die. Strengthen your commitment to the Lord. Strengthen, how are you going to strengthen it? You're going to strengthen it by your devotion to the Lord. Because if you, don't, if you don't have a consistent devotional life, you are getting ready to die. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you don't have a consistent, he said, and then, then complete your works. I have not found your works complete. And that word perfect, it really means complete. You have not completed your works. I heard Deacon Simpson say a few moments ago that he heard somebody say that, that your job is not complete as a disciple until you disciple somebody else. And I ain't talking about making disciples for yourself. I don't need no more Ikes. But I need some disciples of Jesus Christ. And a lot of us, we try to make disciples for ourselves. Jesus showed you better than that. When John disciples, when Jesus came along, John's disciples became Jesus' disciples. They struggled for a little while, but they finally got it together. And, and, and uh, why, why are you going to go to a sub-teacher when you can go to the, uh, 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 Yolanda, when you can go to the master teacher? And they came to the master teacher. And so as a disciple of Jesus Christ, your job is not complete until you disciple somebody else. Yeah. And he said, your, 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 prescription, your, your prescription is to wake up, be alert, be watchful, strengthen the things Oh, yeah, 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 that, that are ready to die. Now, now let, let, let me just flip over there. Let me, let me just flip over there. Uh, well, no, I won't do that right now. But he gives you a prescription. The prescription is to be watchful, strengthen, finish, and then, then verse 3 says, remember. Remember, therefore, how you have received, listen, there it is, and heard. Remember how you received and heard? Hold fast and repent. Repent. And I know that ain't popular preaching, but it's doctrinal preaching. 
And doctrinal preaching uh, not only in, 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 informs my learning, but it influences my living. It ought to, the gospel of Jesus Christ ought to influence my living. I ought not just hear the word, but as James says, I ought to be doers of the word. Yeah, 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 yeah. remember, remember, remember. In other words, and, and, and I think what Jesus is saying is you cannot depend upon the past. He says, and, 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 and that mental court, he said, be where your feet are. Only a few get it. I said, only a few gets it. In verse 4, he says, I have a few names in Sardis. This, this mental coach, he coaches a whole lot of basketball players. Only a few like uh, Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan. They, they are the only ones that get it. Because when they mess up, you don't see them stomping the floor and throwing the ball. They, all they say is, give me the ball again. And let me put it back in the hoop because they want to be where their feet are. And the coach, his, 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 his thrust and, his, and the principle is put your head back in the game and put your head where your feet are. You thinking about what you messed up? You can continue to mess up if all you thinking about is time for you to shoot and you thinking about the last time I messed up. Every time Kobe or somebody like, 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 like Michael Jordan, when they mess up, all they do is turn around and say, let's put the ball in my hand. Give me the ball in my hand. Every time a guy like Tom Brady throws an intersection, section, an interception, he can't wait to get the ball back in his hand because he want to make it right. All he's doing is repenting of what he done in the past. And my question today is, how quick can you get back home? How quick can you get back where your feet are? I know you messed up. We all have messed up and sinned and come short of the glory of God. But how quickly can you repent and get back to where you're supposed to be? And get back to where your feet are? Yeah, 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 yeah. He gives you the prescription. Remember, and repent, because if you don't watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. That's what being alert uh, is all about. And so since I don't know when Jesus is coming, then I got to be alert always. In other words, I'm expecting him. I'm looking for him. You, 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 you've ever been a child and your mom and daddy went away and uh, you know it's about time for them to come back. You'd be at the door looking. And in our case, we were looking way down the lane, way down the road. Because we are expecting them to return. I am expecting Jesus Christ. And so I got to be on my P's and Q's all the time. And so when I mess up, I hurry up and repent and get back to where I'm supposed to be because he might come any minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. Michael Jordan, he said he can't wait to get back on offense and I can't wait to get the relationship back and so I repent in a hurry. I'm not like David. I'm not, going, I'm not stubborn and I'm not going to wait a whole year. Because it'll make you grow old before you're tired. But he says, repent and, and get back. But then, then he also gives us a promise. And uh, I'm glad you asked. The promise is, he who overcomes will be clothed in white garments. 
which simply means the purity of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whiter than snow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus because I am dressed in his righteousness. I have no righteousness of my own because all of our righteousness, says Jeremiah, is like filthy rags in the eyesight of God. And so the only reason that I am worthy is because I'm covered in his blood. He said the promise is he that overcomes shall be clothed in garments and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. <laughs> in other words, I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. Another scripture says, and if you are ashamed of me down here, I'll be ashamed of you when you get before my father. I'm not ashamed. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can a dead person gain life again? I'm glad you asked. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. And he formed man from the dust of the earth. Adam was just a hunk of dirt. Dust, not even dirt, but the residue of dirt. Just dust. And God blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And that's how come Jesus, that's how come Jesus introduces himself to this church as he who, he who holds the seven spirits because in order to be resuscitated, you need the spirit. Let me further press my point. Ezekiel chapter 37. Verse 9 and 10. And he said unto me, Prophesy, O breath. That's the wind. Son of man, say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these who are slain Jesus. that they may live. Jesus. If you are dying, if you are dead, ah, you can be resuscitated by the spirit of the living God. And so Reverend Ezekiel preached. He said, blow wind. When you read the text, he said, come from the four corners of the earth. Blow wind. See, unless you apply the word to your daily life, you have no spirit. Because Jesus said himself that the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Most of the church, most of the congregation at Sardis was dead. A few have not defiled their garments. A few are doing what they need to do. Let me further press, press my point. Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Luke chapter 15 and verse 24. My mistake. For this, my son, watch this, was dead and is alive again. He was dead. He was a dead man walking. 
Yeah. I'm talking about the, he was the living dead. Because that Ephesian passage talks about when you walk in disobedience, you are dead. He said, this is my son, was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry because the boy has come alive. He was alive. Deacon Hagler. He was alive. His feet was in his father's house. But his head was in the far country. And he says to his father, Father, give me the goods that cometh, that falleth to me, that I might go and go and just do whatever I want to do. Whenever you leave the father's house, ain't but one way for you to go, and that's down. He's on his way down. He left the father's house because his feet was in his father's house and his head was in the far country and now he takes his feet to where his head is. And one of the things that we need to stop doing, we need to stop beating parents, need to stop beating themselves up because the children didn't turn out the way you wanted them to turn out. Because we've misused that Proverbs passage. Proverbs 22, verse 6, where it says, train up a child in the way he should go. You've already done that. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. He cannot depart from the way of his training. That doesn't mean he's going to turn around tomorrow. It doesn't mean that you're going to turn around next week. Because we, we, we've made that a guarantee. That's not a guarantee. Yeah. If they embrace it, it's a guarantee. But if they choose not to embrace it, it's not a guarantee. This boy was in the far country. I know he had a good daddy. He was trained the right way, but he still went astray. But in the pig pen, the way began to preach to him. It was, it was, it was, it was not a revival meeting. It was not even more than worship. It wasn't Bible study. He was in the pig pen, and the way he was trained began to preach to him. And now his feet is in the far country and his head is back in the father's house. Yeah, 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 yeah. He said, how many hard servants of my father have bread enough to eat and here I am, starving and ready to eat slop that from the pig pen. He said, you know what I'll do? I'll take the prescription and repent and go back to my father's house. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know what happened. When he got back, see, what we got to do, Debbie, is take the posture of the father. The father's posture is that is after a while, He'll come to himself. In other words, leave the light on. Yeah. The posture of the father is he's going to come back to his training. Train him up in the way. And the way will never depart for him even if he's in disobedience. Stop beating up yourself. And take the father's posture and wait for him to come back home. Yes, Lord. And there is another verse in Isaiah. Now this is the guarantee. 
Isaiah 55 and verse 11. So shall my word that go forth from my mouth shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish what it pleases, and it shall prosper in the things which I send it. If we train up right, God's word cannot come back to him void. It might not happen today, it might not happen tomorrow, it might not even happen this year, but just wait on, wait on the Lord and just tell the Lord to let your wind blow. Yes, Lord, blow wind. We need the wind to blow in Philadelphia. Blow wind. We need the wind to blow in Second Mount Zion. Blow wind. We need the wind to blow all across this country. Blow wind because there's a lot of dead situations that we run into our lives. But it's only the Spirit of God can make alive. Only the Spirit of God can cause you to stand on your feet. For I hear Ezekiel said, I preached to the bones and they stood on their feet. Yes, Lord, but there was no life in the bone. They were the living dead. Yes, Lord. But I heard, yes, I heard, I heard the Lord tell the prophet Ezekiel, I want you to preach to the wind. Hey, hey, I said, ain't he all right? Preach to the wind. And when the wind began to blow, the Bible said they stood on their feet an exceeding great mighty army and so I want the Lord to blow in second Mount Zion I want the Lord to blow in Philadelphia I want the Lord to blow in my home and then I'm gonna sit back and wait I'm gonna wait on the Lord for it's like the spirit of the Lord and the word of the Lord stiffening is like a time release pill. I take a pill and it do me good for 24 hours because it's time release. Hey, hey, when you hear the word, it's like time release. It might not affect you right now. It might not influence your behavior, but every Sunday morning, I'm going to preach until wandering sons come aimlessly back home. I'm going to preach until somebody fall out with their wicked ways and say, what must I do to be saved? Is there anybody here who run into some dead situations? I'm here to tell you that if you know how to repent, if you know how to get back to where your feet are, you need to get your feet where your heads are. For I'm glad, I'm so glad, for I know a Super Bowl is coming up after a while, but I'm so glad that you are absorbed in the moment of worship. Hey, hey, hallelujah, praise his holy name. Is there anybody here who loved the Lord because I was dead in my trespasses, but he died for my sins and your sins. I was dead, but he went to Calvary for me, and he died in my stead, and he have made me alive, and he has influenced my behavior. I'm 
not as bad as I used to be, but I'm still got some incomplete work. I'm not where I'm going to be, but I'm not where I used to be. I'm getting a little close to her. My feet and my head is coming together. For I heard Jesus saying, except he said, I want your body. I want your soul. And I want your mind. I want you to be absorbed. Absorbed in me. Is there anybody here who want to be absorbed in the Lord Jesus Christ? And then you can say, like our four parents, that he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. And all oh, the joy, the joy we share as we tarry here and there, none of other have ever known. And the reason that I can trust in him because I heard, I heard him say that if you tear this building down, I build it up in three days and shown sure up he kept that promise he gave me a promise and the reason I believe that he gonna keep that promise because he fulfilled every promise in the Bible that was written of him they said he would get up in three days and he got up declared to the world that I got a whole power in my hand and then after a while and by and by he released the dynamic atoms from his body cut the wings of the cloud went on back to glory sat down at the right hand of the father and said I'm not going to leave you by yourself and since when he watches over me when I lay my head down I go on to sleep because he never slumbers nor does he sleep he's watching over me hey hey we've got some children that he's watching over hey hey I don't know when and I don't know where but all I know is that God's word will never come back void it's like a time release and it's just a matter of time before they have to come on back in hey hey ain't it all right is there anybody here who been waiting on the Lord have you been waiting keep on waiting and the Lord will his word will never come back void it's just a matter of time after a while and by and by hey hey he's coming back and so you better wake up and be alert because he's coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle and he gonna call his saints back home and those of us who kept his name he's gonna give me a white robe he gonna I'm gonna be robed in his righteousness hey hey ain't he all right won't he make a way for you won't he pick you up and turn you around and plant your feet on a solid rock to stay and you can go everywhere telling the whole world that I know Jesus and Jesus know me do you know him ain't he all right he'll give you healing for your hurts he'll give you balm for your bruises he'll give you life for your dead hey You don't have to be walking around dead, but you can be resuscitated. You can be resuscitated. I don't know what they use in the hospital, that thing that, you know, y'all, the defibrillator. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is the defibrillator. If he blows on you, he can make you live again. Apostle Paul said, we were dead in trespasses, but he made us alive. 
Amen. Because in the past, we walked according to the wiles of the devil in disobedience. But he, through his obedience, made us alive. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that Jesus makes alive any dead situation that you run into. My prayer is blow wind. And the wind always symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And he can make alive as we are standing upon our feet. The door of the church is open for church membership and Christian discipleship. The opportunity is yours and the invitation to Christian discipleship and church membership is extended to you. He's calling for you. You can walk and still be dead. But if you step forward and repent, <clears throat> see, it's not, it's not just repent, but how soon can I repent and get back to of having my feet where my head is and be absorbed in what God is doing? He's calling for you. He's letting his world turn for you. Is there one? God bless you. to prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. We're going to ask Deacon Hagler if he would come and ask God's blessings upon the bread and the wine. Our Father and our God, right now as we have bowed heads and humbled hearts, we come to say thank you. 
Yeah, Lord. Father God, we thank you once again for this appointed time. Yeah, Lord. That we may be able to partake of this, your communion. So, Father God, I ask that you convert these elements to a spiritual use. Lord God, have your way. And as we go into our secret closet, Lord God, and as we prepare to take this bread and this wine, we take it in your name. Yeah, Lord. In remembrance of that time when you instituted it. Mm. So that we would truly know that you are God and you're God all by yourself. So Father God, as we go into this communion portion of our service, continue to bless us as only you can bless us. Continue to keep us as only you can keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. It was on that dark Thursday evening when Jesus had gathered into that large upper room with his disciples and the cross loomed heavily in his path. It was there that night that he took bread and said, this do in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, they took the cup, the cup of the New Testament. We know that there can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Jesus shed his blood in order that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly and they all drank together. And after supper, they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Amen, don't forget your tithes today. Tithes, amen, your tithes and offerings. Amen. If you don't have an envelope, haven't dropped it in yet, raise your hand. Amen. Uh, you need an envelope? Oh, you got, oh, you just showing me you got it. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Don't forget it. And this time, uh, the hymn will serve as the benediction. Peace.